My name is Alyssa Fisher, and I'm the policy director at the Washington Center for Equitable Growth. Equitable Growth is a research and policy organization looking at inequality and economic growth. Um, and we have what we think is going to be a very interesting discussion lined up for you all tonight. We're here, of course, to discuss Tim O'Reilly's new book, WTF, What's the Future and Why It's Up to Us. This book is a timely look at big questions that many of us have been thinking about. Technology is changing our economy and the nature of work, and our economy is growing, but inequality is on the rise. According to Tim, it's time to rewrite the rules. I want to introduce Tim and Heather Boucher, who will be leading our conversation. Heather is the Executive Director and Chief Economist of the Washington Center for Equitable Growth. And Tim O'Reilly is the founder and CEO of O'Reilly Media, a leading publisher in the computer technology space. He has a history of convening conversations that reshape the computer industry. If you've heard the term open source software or web 2.0 or government as a platform, he's had a hand in framing each of those big ideas. In addition to his role at O'Reilly Media, Tim is a partner at early stage venture firm O'Reilly Alpha Tech Ventures and on the boards of Maker Media, Code for America, PeerJ, Civis Analytics, and PopFox. For this book, he draws on insights from his career and presents a framework for thinking about how technologies such as world-spanning platforms and networks, on-demand services, and artificial intelligence are changing the nature of business, education, government, financial markets, and the economy as a whole. He has taken a thoughtful approach to what this means and how we might create a better future. We are glad to have him here to discuss this more in depth. Welcome, Heather and Tim. All right. So, WTF. That takes some uh, chutzpah to name your book WTF. Yeah, you know, it's sort of funny because uh, you know, of course, what WTF means. <laughs> uh, and uh, I came up with this uh, idea that, no, it stands for what's the future when I wanted to use it for this talk I gave at the White House Frontiers Conference. Uh, where I was sort of one of the warm-up acts for President Obama. And then I got it past White House comms was, uh, uh, I, was something I was very proud of. <laughs> and was that uh, before or after they started their win the future agenda? Uh, I don't remember. Okay. But, uh, you know, for me, I think it probably was. Uh, but I, um, you know, the thing about WTF that I think is great uh, as an expression is it can be an expression of amazement or it can be an expression of dismay. And I do think that technology is bringing both of those things uh, to all of us. And in a lot of ways, the, the arc of the book is what do we learn from technology platforms about how to create the WTF of amazement rather than the WTF of dismay. Well, so I was just debating whether or not to read this long quote from the introduction to your book, but would you mind? Because I think no, it ahead. actually just touches on exactly what you just said. Um, so on page XVI, don't ask me what number that is, I won't remember, maybe 16? 16. Yeah, thank you, 16. Um, so, and I quote, we are at a very dangerous moment in history. The concentration of wealth and power in the hands of a global elite is eroding the power and sovereignty of nation states while globe-spanning technology platforms are enabling, uh, are enabling algorithmic control of firms, institutions, and societies, shaping what billions of people see and understand and how the economic pie is divided. At the same time, income inequality and the pace of technolo technology change are leading to a populist backlash featuring opposition to science, distrust of our governing institutions, and fear of the future, fear of the future, um, making it ever more difficult to solve the problems we have created. Which I just, as I read that, um, as I was starting your book a, a, a while ago, uh, I was like, this is an important book. It's, it's looking at these important challenges. So tell us a little bit more about why you wrote the book and why you wrote that, that, that paragraph. Well, I, I started uh, focusing on this area uh, probably around 2011, 2012. Uh, 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 it probably really crystallized when I heard Nick Hanauer uh, give his talk at TED University in which he said, you know, I'm a rich guy. I was the first, you know, non-family investor in Amazon. I, you know, I've become a venture capitalist. And I'm sick and tired of hearing that people like me create jobs. Only one thing creates jobs, and that's customers. And we've been screwing people for so long that they're not going to be able to afford to be our customers anymore. And I thought that was a beautiful summation 
of this fundamental problem that we'd all been seeing in our economy. And of course, you know, you know we were wrestling with that uh, you know, from the early days uh, in technology. You know, I, I, I began my career uh, at the time when the PC had first come in, and uh, it was this huge explosion of innovation. And then as Microsoft became dominant, I watched as they basically sucked all the value out of that ecosystem. They became yeah. this incredibly dominant company. Uh, and you know, they literally were going down to Silicon Valley and dictating what people could invest in and what they couldn't. And all the innovators went somewhere else. And that, of course, sort of corresponded to most of my career, which was going and finding people who were on the fringes in some new area, because that's where there was opportunity, because I saw these companies becoming extractive. And so I became associated with the open source movement and the early internet and trying to tell the story of, hey, can you guys just be more equitable? You know, my mom, uh, I was explaining uh, you know, Microsoft's behavior one time. And I, I know Bill has gotten uh, to be quite a humanitarian. Uh, but uh, at the time, I thought her description was very apt. She said, my, he sounds like someone who'd come over to your house for dinner and say, I think I'll have all the mashed potatoes. <laughs> And you know that kind of attitude runs all through our society. And in fact, it seems to me, and, and I think part of what I tried to tell in the book is the story of why I think that is, that that behavior is condoned, that we literally tell companies that they should go after that, that it's OK for them to say, I think I'll take all the mashed potatoes. Yeah. Well, so, um, so t tell us a little bit more. I mean, you have a lot of policy recommendations interwoven throughout the book. And for those of us that live and work in Washington, it's sort of not the usual, yeah. um, you know, you give the, the problem identification, and then you've got the policy solutions where you can find them you know, clearly in one place, So, which actually makes it much more interesting. Um, but you know, I wanted to, to really push you on this, this question about, um, you know, these platform firms, I mean, which is kind of what you're getting at here. They're, they're not just eating all the mashed potatoes, but they're making sure that nobody else can actually come mm -hmm. uh, and have a seat at the table. Firms like Google, Facebook, Amazon. And these are now a really important parts of our economy. Um, and we've done some research and have elevated some research of equitable growth showing that um, you know, as you've seen this increased concentration, it's, it's, there's, it's led to less competition, it's led to um, higher prices for, for workers, or for, um, for consumers, and often lower wages for workers. And so, you know, how can we, do you, do you have suggestions on, on what we can do about this? How can we regulate these yeah. platforms and reinvigorate that sense of competition so that one, yeah. one person isn't getting all the mashed potatoes? Well, first off, I, I, I do think that uh, enlightened self-interest is a powerful tool. And companies need to understand uh, that the economy works better when they don't do that. You know, and I, I, so, you know, I think before you ask, you know, there's this wonderful uh, quote from Lao Tzu, who, uh, the Chinese philosopher who wrote the, the Tao Te King. And, and he says, uh, you know, losing the way of life, uh, people uh, rely on goodness. Losing goodness, they rely on laws. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've always loved that because, and, and you know, throughout my career, I've tried to say what we're trying to figure out is what is the way of life? What, is, what are the things that actually make the system work better? And that is the quest in technology. And you know, we, we learn, for example, that simple systems uh, work better than complex systems. Uh, that complexity evolves from simple systems, whereas if you try to design it for every eventuality from the beginning, you get it wrong. Uh, you know, we, so in a lot of ways, the book is uh, uh, an exploration of what have we learned from technology that might apply to the economy. And so, but back to this question of mm -hmm. these, these great firms, the thing that I, I think is really important that they have to understand that they're platforms, that they're marketplaces, and that if marketplaces don't work for all of their participants, they eventually lose. And so I, you know, a lot of what I'm kind of preaching is you know, self-interested. You know, Alexis de Tocqueville called it a self-interest properly regarded. You know? Well, and I mean, what's interesting about that is that that's a perspective that we try to encourage policymakers to take, because mm -hmm. they have to be thinking about mm -hmm. what's good for the whole economy, not necessarily yeah. what's good for an individual firm. I think a lot of the pushback that you hear is that, um, 
you know, individual firms, they want to make a lot of money. And, and do you find that business owners and leaders in your world, both inside your world, but, but in the sort of the broader business community, find that compelling for their own business model? Or is this really a message that you think would resonate, resonates more with, with the policymaking community? I think both. I mean, first of all, I do think that there are a lot of people in tech who really mean well and they want to build a better world. I mean, you know, when you, you know, look at people like Larry and Sergey at Google or Mark Zuckerberg, they, they, they're really trying to build something that they think will make the world a better place. But they don't understand what they're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, none of us do. I mean, policymakers, same thing. And I use the image uh, in the book that the systems we're building today are a lot like the genies of Arabian mythology. You know, you all know the story, you get three wishes. And everybody always gets the wish wrong, right? <laughs> so you know, here's Facebook. And they, they, they figured out this wish that they're going to give to their system. You know, the, these algorithmic systems we're building uh, you know, are these amazing uh, you know, workers who are building today's world. And, and so they say, hey, we, you know, we want you to make more engaging content. When people uh, you know, share stuff or they like it, show them more of it. And they thought, this is going to make this great community. It's going to make people connect more and see more of the stuff from their friends. They had no idea that what was going to happen was that uh, you know, spammers would figure out how to manipulate it, that you know, uh, you know, foreign governments would get involved. And now they're scrambling to try to fix it. Now I look over another system that's a vast algorithmic system. And we don't see it that way, our financial markets. Yeah. And what was the wish that our financial markets expressed? They said that the responsibility of business is to maximize your profits. Mm -hmm. That's Milton Friedman, 1970. And it's really interesting that the great divergence of the continued upward slope of productivity and you know, family income flattening out happened about the time that that shareholder value wish was put into our economic systems. And I'm really uh, struck, and I talk a little bit about this in the book. I mean, I'm, I'm really an amateur historian. Most of the book is coming from my experience in the technology industry, but I, I've been imbibing uh, you know, history and uh, economics. Uh, Hal Varian was one of my readers, and he kind of kept saying, oh, no, you have to go read this economics paper. So I kind of got my, my uh, you know, impromptu economic training at the feet of one of the masters. But I... Uh, uh, you know, I basically look at the history of what happened, for example, after World War I versus World War II. You know, we punished the losers after yeah. World War I. Uh, we ignored people. We had this uh, massive inequality. We ended up with this, you know, global uh, uh, Great Depression and another World War. You know, after World War II, they were scared shitless about what had happened. And they went, oh, you know, we don't want to do that again. They made these bold policy decisions to invest in lifting up the countries that had been destroyed by war. You know, we rebuilt you know, Europe, we rebuilt Japan, our former enemies. We took all the soldiers who came back and instead of seeing them camped out on the Washington Monument and firing on them with you know, soldiers as we did after you know, World War I, we had the GI Bill, we sent them back to school, we gave them money to invest in businesses, farms, homes. You know, we made policy decisions that were all about actually putting people back to work, you know, solving the problems. And we had this sort of miraculous period of prosperity. Now, here's the thing. That was also a flawed wish because after 30 years of that, we ended up with a lot of inflation because we'd put in place policies that didn't quite work the way that people intended. And then they went, oh, well, let's go back the other way. We have, to, we have to tame inflation, became the master wish. And we have to actually favor capital. So the, the thing that I guess I, I, I'm trying to get across is we can see it in Facebook. We can see that Facebook has to fix their algorithms. Yeah. And we have to actually take that lesson, that same lesson, and apply it to policy. You know, because what we're doing is we keep going back and doing the same thing over and over again. You know, and, and we have to actually look at this Washington establishment and say, we designed a system. It's not doing what we expected. Let's design something else. Yeah, well, that's one of the things that you talk about in the book. And I had another, a much shorter quote, but uh, just something that really struck me. Um, you have a whole section of three chapters where you talk about um, 
uh, well, really one, the government is a platform chapter in, in this section in the middle of the book. And you, you, you end this chapter about government as a platform by saying, while it's popular in Silicon Valley, which often leans libertarian, to deride the intrusive, the intrusive role of government, reinventing government to bring it up to date with the rest of society is one of the grand challenges, one of the grand challenges of the 21st century. And um, I mean, I was struck, it's sort of, uh, sort of right in the middle of the book as you're talking about the future, and I wanna get, my next question, I want to get to robots, so don't. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll yeah. get to that next. But we're, you know, sort of talking about the role of technology, and you know, sort of you say that that actually how we think about government is actually a part of that challenge as well, and what we need to do. So, tell us a little bit about, you know, how you think about government as a platform, and what do you tell us more about what you mean by that, especially because there's people yeah. both online and in the audience here. This is what we do for a living. Yeah. Uh, well. Back around 2008, I had this brainstorm, uh, which was, I, I noticed that there were uh, government people who were coming to my so-called Web 2.0 conferences, and I was talking with a friend who I worked with on this, Eric uh, Foro, uh, and he said, I said, I want to see if we can bring a lot more government people to our event, and he said, why don't we do an event in DC? So we started this event called the Gov 2.0 Summit, which was to try to bring together Silicon Valley and government, and we did it here in DC in 2009, 2010. And I was trying to figure out what would the focus and the storyline be. And I remember talking to Eric Schmidt. I went, you know, Eric, you, you spent a lot of time in D.C. And he said, no, I don't know what you should do. You're good at this. He said, go to D.C., talk to a lot of people, and uh, it will come to you. <laughs> <laughs> and so I went around talking to a lot of people. And it was actually a conversation with a guy named Frank DiGiamarino, who at the time was at NAPA, the National uh, Academy of Public Administration. And Frank basically said, you know, well, I have this idea that government should be a convener. And he mentioned to me uh, a book that had been written by a guy named Donald Kettle. Uh, uh, I forget what the title of the book was. But in it, uh, Donald had the image of government as a vending machine. OK. Uh, and he actually meant it uh, as, you know, we put in taxes and we get out things like roads and, and so on. And I had this image, because it was right, right at the rise of social media and government. Everybody thought that was about what it was about. And I went, no, no, that's not what it's about. That's just like, you know, we have this idea of government as a vending machine. And, you know, citizen involvement means giving people another way to shake the vending machine. <laughs> I said, no, actually, there's another analogy which is, is much better, which is the Apple App Store, which was just new then, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when that came out. And I said, that's what a platform means. You get more stuff in the vending machine, <laughs> you know? And, uh, you know, so I said, you know, when, you know, and I thought about the way government procurement works. And, uh, you know, so like basically people get in the back room. This is the way the phones used to work. Right, you know, the, the, the phone manufacturer, the carriers get together, they decide on the 20 apps that the phone would have, right. you know, and some of them are standard, but maybe they'll have a little bit of innovation. And then through this magic, actually it started as a hack, people don't realize that the app store came from what was called jailbreaking hackers who said, wait, I wanna do more with this phone. And then Apple went along with it and they basically opened up the app store and we saw millions of apps on phones. And I thought, well, how could we do that for government? And that was sort of leading uh, you know, to this idea that you know, these, these vast technology platforms are now doing things, uh, you know, you know, everything from cloud computing to building services with APIs that separate the interfaces from uh, the back end. Mm -hmm. And so we, you, know, you think about you go to, uh, you want to rent a hotel room, you can go to the hotel website, you can go to Kayak and go to Travelocity. That's because there's these things called application programming interfaces, and the hotel reservation systems can be called, you know, by a program that says, "Hey, give me a reservation." Governments don't work that way, right. you know. So it was really this idea that we could start to build reusable components. But then we went from there really into thinking about all the other things that government could learn from, you know, from technology. You know, the process of continual experimentation. And then my wife Jen Palka, who's sitting over there. Uh, uh, who was working with me on the event, quit to start Code for America, uh, which is really originally working with cities, but has really developed into working on uh, national programs but that are usually administered by states. So, for example, working to improve the operation of food stamps. And she had this you know, brilliant insight, which is that one of the big things that uh, technology, technologists do that government doesn't do is this you know, process of of measuring and understanding 
and feeding back into the workflows. Yeah. You know, so if constant, you know, go, improvement. Go, constant improvement. So you know, Google or Amazon or Facebook is doing millions of tests, you know, of different features, and they try that. And uh, you know, what we end up doing at Code for America is, is uh, in some sense, hacking the system. So we built this alternate interface to, to food stamps where we can follow the users. Ah. And we can find out what blocks they're coming to and then feed that back into the, uh, the bureaucratic processes so they can fix them. So there's that whole element. And anyway, Jen also went to the White House and along with Haley Van Dyke, who's sitting right there with her, uh, they basically uh, started something called the United States Digital Service, um, and, uh, which is still, uh, still going, which was really an attempt to bring uh, those technology practices to government. And that was built on top of the you know, uh, the, the, the incredible work that was done by the team that, that rescued healthcare.gov. So, so some of that, so that second part is about getting government to work better. Yeah. But then the first part, which I think is also really profoundly mm -hmm. important, and I had an aha moment as you were talking about, is, was about, so government has all of this data, um, I mean, which seems mm -hmm. the, the, the easiest uh, I'm sure there are other aspects, mm -hmm. but you've got data on, um, you know, economic conditions. You've got census data. You've got data on weather. You know, you've got mm -hmm. these things. And yeah. so part of what you're saying is that um, part of what government is doing and how it's supporting industry and supporting people is by mm -hmm. making this information available yeah. in formats that anybody can use. And I think, is that part of what you're saying? That's part of it, but it's really not the important part, I okay. think. I mean. Uh, a lot of people went into this world of open data. And sure, open data, super important. But it's really about operations. Uh, yeah, okay. You know, it's ultimately about does this stuff work? And it's about imagining how services could be if we use today's technology. You know, effectively, we're still living in the system of government that was invented by the British Empire in, in the Victorian era. You know, it's basically a bureaucratic form-based, uh, you know, business. And, you know, you just, and we've translated to the, to the uh, Victorian era. And this is, uh, is kind of an idea that I think runs through the book, that, that, that people have this framing blindness where we, we, you know, we think about the world in terms of what's familiar. And periodically, technology, you know, gives us new tools. You know, and uh, one of the recent examples that I like to point to is, uh, you know, with Uber and Lyft. Yeah. You know, we had, uh, everybody said, oh, we know what to do with the connected taxi cab. We'll put a screen in the back and we'll show little, uh, you know, news clips and ads. <laughs> you know, and then, you know, it was a few years later, they were like, no, no, actually, there's a way better thing we can do with the connected taxi cab. You can call it on demand from wherever you are. And I go, well, you know, uh, there's this wonderful illustration that uh, one of the Code for America uh, uh, team put together of you know how government services ought to work you know and and this is the real the functional use of open data it's like Joe we saw you were laid off from your job you know and we're so sorry to hear it yeah. uh, you know uh, your benefits will start on Friday uh, you know uh, and we'll be reaching out to you uh, to let you know what other services you're available for just remember we've got your back you know and you get this text you know immediately because you know guess what you know, through all this, uh, you know, uh, information that gets filed, you know, there should be a loop that gets closed there. Instead, it's like, instead it goes into some form, gets filed yeah. away. Uh, you know, it's crazy. Making it we, we, better. We, we could basically reinvent this thing using technology we have today. And, and there's a whole thing about benefits, like portable benefits yeah. is a great example to talk about there. No, and that is a, that is a great example. I want to spend a couple of minutes yeah. on robots, though, or yeah. just techno technological change. So, you know, we all know the story, and those of us who study economics, I mean, it, I feel like especially over the past three or four years, all you hear about mm -hmm. is yeah. AI, um, the mm -hmm. robots are taking over, what are we going to do about it? They're going to mm -hmm. take all of our jobs. I was at a panel yesterday where um, one of the panelists made the point that if that actually does happen, that the robots do take all of our jobs, um, we don't need to worry about it because there'll only be like 100 people that own all the robots and there'll just be a mass uprising, which I found somewhat uplifting. So I thought I would share that here. He was, yeah. like, he was like, you don't actually need to worry about the really dystopian outcome yeah. because, human, because the humans will revolt. But then I've seen those, those uh, Battlestar Galactic um, shows, so I don't know. But anyway, I digress. Um, my question here is that 
you know, you make this very optimistic argument in your book that um, history tells us that technology kills, and I'm quoting, history tells us technology kills professions, but it does not kill jobs, end quote. Can you explain what you mean by that? Give us your, your yeah. take on this question. Well, we have a, uh, a very concrete example, and Michael Mandel at the Progressive Policy Institute has been writing about this recently, and his, his work is very well worth uh, studying, although I had not seen it at the time I wrote the book. Uh, nor did I actually have the story I'm about to tell you. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, uh, it came out recently that in the period from 2014 to the middle of 2016, Amazon added uh, 45,000 robots to their warehouses. In that same period, they added 250,000 workers. Mm -hmm. Now, why is that? Now, our narrative, narrative shapes what we do. And our traditional narrative is, oh, we know what you do with robots. You get rid of people because your whole goal is to increase your profits. And that's not what Jeff Bezos did. He's actually sold the markets that he's going to do something different. And so what did he do? He said, wow, we can use these robots to pack more products into the uh, warehouses. We can use these robots to turn around customer requests faster. So we can get more products shipped out same day. In fact, in some zip codes, we can send out products and get them delivered uh, you know, same day, you know, not just the uh, next day. That's happened to me. That's, That's right. Cool. So, you know, so I kind of come away with this. Is this is the master design pattern for technology. Do more. Right? Not cut costs. It's do more. You know, so you know, my call in the book to technologists and to policymakers is set up policies to solve the world's problems. I mean, again, you say, well, just delivering you know, goods faster. That's not solving the world's problems. But, uh, you know, whether it's in something like that, you see what happens. You know, when in the Industrial Revolution, when they started making, you know, you know, clothing with these new machines, they made more clothing. You know, ordinary people got lots of clothes instead of just rich people. You know, when food became much cheaper because of mechanized agriculture, you know, we started making more interesting food, more variety of food. You know, we didn't just go, oh yeah, you all get the same stuff, just cheaper. You know, the, the master thing that we do, humans, we add creativity to commodities. And that's one, re that's I guess why I think, let the robots do all the automated stuff. The fundamental issue is the issue of distribution. Yep. And we have, you know, we have an economics of scarcity where what we tell ourselves and what we've been telling ourselves is we have to optimize for capital. And you know, again, this is just like Facebook. You know, we have to optimize for engagement. And you go, yeah, well, you had a theory about that. And it's pretty clear that it had some side effects. So let's figure out how to fix it. Yeah, well, uh, one thing that you, um, that you talk about that's a little bit m less positive on the mm -hmm. job front is that um, you talk about um, the algorithm being the, quote, new shift boss. Yeah. That there are these firms that are using um, algorithms to determine uh, what people's hours and schedules are and, um, and how to use yeah. workers really efficiently in ways that may not work for workers or their families mm -hmm. um, or anything yeah. like that. So um, talk a little bit about that. Like, yeah. how, 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 can, how does that fit into your Well, uh, the reason story? I like to tell that story is because there was a lot of, there are a lot of people who are freaking out about uh, Uber and Lyft and the on-demand economy. You know, this idea these these workers don't have, um, you know, a job. Uh, they're on their own. Uh, they don't have any benefits. And, you know, one of the things that I try to do in my life as a technologist is to notice things that other people don't notice. And what I noticed was, well, okay, yeah, Uber and Lyft are using this algorithmic marketplace that allows them to, you know, bring together all these independent contractors to do this job. Uh, and, and there's this debate, should they be W-2, should they not? Meanwhile, over on the W-2 side in traditional jobs, there are also algorithmic systems, these algorithmic scheduling systems used by fast food or, or retailers. And those scheduling systems have been given an instruction. And that instruction is make sure, first of all, make sure that we use people as efficiently as possible, reduce our costs. Hey, and one of the things we figured out that you can do to reduce your costs is make sure that nobody ever gets full-time work because then we don't have to pay benefits. So people have hacked the system so that a W-2 job, low-wage job, has no benefits anyway. 
You know, so now here's the interesting question. You go, we have this technology. We could completely rethink benefits. We could say, oh, they go with the person, not with the job. And we could erase that whole W2, 1099 dis distinction. We could say, we're going to basically track when people work. It doesn't matter who they work for. We're just going to allocate the benefit load across all the companies. I mean, across all the people they work for. You know, so it's, again, this idea that you know, new capabilities come on stream, and we take them up unevenly as a society. And one of the things that policymakers have to do, just like technologists have to do, is to say, you know, oh, that didn't used to be possible. We could do that now. Yeah, well, and to start new conversations. I mean, that conversation yeah. specifically, uh, we've had, for those of us who think about social policy and labor markets, we've spent lifetimes uh, thinking about the fact that we don't have something like, say, universal health care yeah. that is not attached to the employer, right. right, which other countries do, or paid family leave, again, that could be mm -hmm. not attached to the employer but could just be a right. And, um, and this conversation about firms wanting the flexibility to have these 1099 workers actually opens up a new space to say, okay, well, we could rethink all of this, but the important thing is making yeah. sure that people have that standard of living and that they have those Absolutely. jobs. And as long as you keep that front and center, I love the idea of opening up yeah. that conversation, well, which is about actually just one thing, yeah. which is what I'm going to do in the next few sentences here, open up the conversation. I thought that was beautiful. Nice little segue. Um, had to go with it. Um, so we, I'll let you say what you're going to say, and I'm going to ask one more question, but then I'm going to yeah. throw it all open to you. So get them yeah. ready, and I interrupt Yeah, I was just going to say that, that you know, to me, one of the real goals for uh, government policy should be to focus on outcomes, not on uh, the, the pr processes that we've identified that we think will give us those outcomes. You know? and, and we've got to keep adjusting. We've got to really shift our mindset. And I, I have a chapter on what I called at one point, on, I think some sort of unfortunately algorithmic regulation that of course scares everybody. You know, it should really just be outcome-based regulation. I, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I also want to give a quick um, note that one of our first grantees that we funded were um, scholars uh, that um, looked at the scheduling issue um, at, and did a pilot study at The Gap in the San Francisco, the, mm -hmm. the flagship store downtown there, started there, worked with the, the Gap and all of its stores to uh, come up with new technology so that they could actually have schedules that work for the workers, but yeah. that also work for the employers. And they spent a lot of time, the grant actually took a lot longer than they expected because they spent so much time having to figure out the tech part of it because a lot of the, um, the tech that has been developed for scheduling has really been focused on just what the employer's cost-cutting needs, not actually making it easier right. for people to, to swap shifts and stuff. But once you open your mind to that, you can really make that happen. Right. Um, Which goes to show, again, it's just like we've got to remember what we're asking our genies to do. Yeah. yeah. All right. So you geniuses, genie, geniuses, um, <laughs> uh, any questions out here? Questions? Yeah. So, um, how, you know, oh, sorry, your point on how jobs change or, or how jobs are lost and then created as a historical cycle just was just making me think about um, the French experience during the Industrial Revolution and how there was a lot of panic, especially in Paris, over artisans who were worried about the loss of their jobs when, you know, industrialization was going to create a lot of products that they were making. And so I was thinking that now, I feel like we're seeing that now with a lot of industrial workers worried that robots are going to replace their jobs who are kind of like yeah. some stuff. And so how, how would you propose, I guess, that um, government or policy deal with replacing those jobs since it doesn't seem there's an easy solution to well, creating like a similar job? It seems to me that the first thing that we have to do is stop telling companies that they must optimize solely for shareholder value. I mean, that's the basic instruction that we give to companies. You know, Leo Strine at the... You know, uh, you know, Supreme Court in Delaware basically says, his chief justice there says, you know, no, shareholder value, it has its basis in law. All these companies are registered in Delaware. You know, so Lynn Stout's shareholder value myth notwithstanding, you know, companies feel they, that is in fact their legal obligation. We should address that. We should go, no, you actually have to start treating people as an asset. You know, and also just think about financial statements. You know, where do they show people? Cost. You know, we, we even talk about the bottom line. This is the thing that you're taught in business school that you're trying to optimize for, is the money that's left over at the end. 
You know, and I don't think the business has to be that way. It's not how I run my business, but we have a financial system. And there's a whole chapter in the book about uh, the stock market and why, you know, even companies uh, like Google and Facebook uh, that have dual stock structures are still trapped in the system because they have to have their stock keep going up so they can keep paying uh, these employees and what I call super money. You know? <laughs> Well, is, so is this, just to follow up on that question, is this a, is this a, a Delaware policy question? Is it no, about I, their incorporation I, rules? Or how, where's the where's I, I the think lever? it's everything, Financial Standards Board. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I'm not quite sure where you cut that Gordian knot, but I think we need to take it up. But there's also another piece, which is, uh, I think there's a, a different approach to antitrust law. And this comes back mm -hmm. to your uh, first question, Heather, about the power of platforms. If we understand that, there are really two classes of companies today. There are companies that have a kind of natural monopoly or some level of serious market power. And I'm not just talking about the big tech firms. Uh, uh, they have a responsibility to their ecosystem. Uh, and a story that uh, came up that really illustrated this to me was uh, InBev, a company that owns Anheuser-Busch, mm -hmm. buying up uh, hop, the hop supply and using it to squeeze out craft brewers. Now, based on my understanding of the economy, if I look at the long-term you know, path, when I say, what do I think the economy of the future is? It's a creative economy. A creative economy writ large. That doesn't mean people writing poems and you know, music. It means making craft beer, making specialty coffee, you know, inventing new kinds of products. And so when you see a company that says, I'm going to use my market power to squeeze the, the small companies in a market, you know, uh, it, that is the thing that we should be watching for. And we should be saying, if you have market power, you have an obligation to companies that depend on you. And do you think that's true for someplace like Amazon as well? And I saw your hand there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Sure. I, I actually, it's great to follow up. I think. Uh, one, of the, oh. one of the things that I have kind of noticed, you know, if you saw early on, uh, yeah, I'm pretty familiar with Madison, Wisconsin. They tried to implement some, some strict rules as it relates to Uber and Lyft. And the, both companies kind of went in very aggressively to state legislature and demanded like a preemption law, right? And, and, and that's, that's fine, right? And they, they got it passed very, fairly quickly and the, 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 the city regulation was, was gone. So one of the things that I, I feel like I struggle with is, you know, I, I'm a left-leaning progressive and I, you know, I generally think that most regulations are in support of, you know, health, welfare, you know, that kind of thing. But, uh, you know, I, I keep being told that there's a lot of regulations that support kind of the Microsofts like you talked about and, and the, the rent seeking kind of, you mm -hmm. know, monopolies yeah. out there. Um, and, and I was wondering if, if in your book or in, in your experience, you've kind of seen any places where, like, like where the line is and, and, and it, like, I guess, gratuitous, like, like extreme examples of that type of, you know, uh, influence peddling and then therefore rent, rent extracting? Or uh, uh, where do you not see it? <laughs> I mean, we, we saw a great example just recently. Uh, and uh, again, my, my wife just wrote about this uh, at length in uh, Oracle's advice to the Trump administration uh, about government modernization. Uh, their advice was, uh, the government shouldn't know anything about technology. You know, doing things like the United States Digital Service, where they're, uh, you know, having people on staff who actually know technology. This is is not the role for government. You know, why is that? Because they want to basically keep incredibly overcharging government because of, of ignorance. And and you see this all through. You know, uh, you know, companies try very hard uh, to use government. And in fact, that is an argument that conservatives use for saying there should be less government. And I go, no, no, we just need to have government that works. You know, it needs to be an effective counterbalance. Government that works, that's not a, that's a, that's a theme. Yes, you, right here. Thank you. Um, so thank you very much for being here. There's a microphone right behind you. Oh, really? Oh, thank you. Um, oh, wow, OK. So um, when you were talking about Amazon and all the jobs that they added, um, it just made me think about all the people's personal stories that I've read about, like a real estate broker, broker who lost her job because of automation. Um, a pill counter who lost a job because of a machine that now can count pills, and that's just better for health. Um, so there are all these things that are coming up. Maybe those people don't want to work for Amazon, or maybe they can't 
properly yeah. retrain for a job that is available or made available due to technological technological changes. Um, so what would you say um, to that? And um, even though there are jobs available, maybe people don't want them. And if we're going to put people first instead of profits, for example, uh, which is how we currently run, um, how are we effectively going to put people first and really value them when they don't have the jobs they need and that wages aren't where they need to be, they can't meet their basic needs, and what do we do there? Yeah, I think uh, you know, it's a complex set of, uh, of issues you raise there. Uh, and first off, there is the fact that you know, the market system has proven to be an engine of prosperity in general. Uh, it is a, you know, and systems that try to be too controlled don't, have, have actually not produced prosperity, have not produced, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the equitable society that they hope for. Uh, and so there is that. Uh, you know, there is, if there is dislocation, I don't think people are owed, well, you can have your old job just because. You know, I mean, I look at my business. I've had to reinvent it constantly in order to you know, keep it growing. And we all have to reinvent ourselves. Uh, what we do have to do, though, is to say, you know, I, I look at the way people think about uh, jobs. You, know, you hear all these stories. Well, employers can't find the people they need. You know, and I go, it's like they, we went to the supermarket and they were out of toilet paper. You know, it's like you know, so we went and they didn't have the exact person. I go, you ever hear about training? Did you ever hear about the possibility of finding someone with talent and giving them a chance? And I think about how I started my business. I actually had this, this hack. I was a writer who didn't know anything about computers, and I had a friend who was a programmer who didn't know how to write, and he got asked to write a manual, and he, he, he basically, I said I'd help him out, and we started this company together, and we sold him this idea that a programmer and a writer together could do this job. That, you know. And then I used that in my early business where I basically sold jobs on the basis of my reputation and I hired people who I believed could do it with the right kind of training and backup, but the, the companies would never have hired. And that was, that was sort of my hack that I built my company on. It's like, we have to actually invest in people. And you know, someone like Larry Fink, who you know, runs BlackRock, the largest investment you know, company in the world, you know, recently said, all these companies saying we got nothing to invest in, that's why we're doing stock buybacks. And he's like, yeah, you do, invest in your people. You know, and I think higher wages, uh, you, know, you know, generous benefits. Um, uh, there's a lot of things that we can do. Uh, but I think people do have to be willing to, to move to opportunity and look for opportunity and take responsibility for learning new skills. You know, I don't think, uh, uh, you know, I think there's an old Hawaiian saying that goes something like, no one promised us tomorrow. And we, we do have, you know, we, we do have to have people take responsibility on both sides. So two, I'll just note two, two notes on that, and then I, there was a, yeah, over there. But so two notes on that. One is um, you know, what we've actually seen is a decline in people moving in the United yeah. States since the Great Recession. Um, and some of that could be home prices, it could be a variety of things, but so that's, that's a challenge. And then the other thing that I've heard a lot on this particular topic is that um, because firms, because people don't stay in jobs for as long, and you know, one way to look at that is that you know, firms don't invest in people so they don't stay. The other yeah. way is that firms saying, well, I could, inv I could hire this person, train them up, but then they're just gonna leave and go to my competitor. And so now you're seeing these um, uh, uh, rules where they're asking, what's there's like a word for this that I'm just blanking on, where they're asking people to sign these agreements, oh, yeah. non-competes, so they, yeah. they don't go over to another firm if they're making any investment, which is, I mean, that's gotta be stifling growth. So. So yeah, I absolutely. agree with everything you've yeah. just said, and, and yet the trends in so many ways are actually pushing in the opposite direction. Right, right. But direction. again, this would be uh, you know, an ideal you know, focus for government to act as a counterweight for that and to stop incentivizing it. And, and again, the, to me, the master incentives are all, you know, I, I wrote this uh, one paper which hasn't been published yet, but you know, Meckling and Jensen was the paper that talked about, uh, in 1976, talked about aligning uh, uh, management compensation with shareholder value, and Michael Jensen sort of preached that gospel. And I go, you know, 
You know, Meckling and Jensen, you know, Dow 22,500. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yay. Meckling and Jensen, passenger dragged off of, uh, of United Airlines by the feet. Meckling and Jensen, you know, uh, yeah. all these people out of work. Meckling and Jensen, you know, we are getting the economy that we ask for. And I think the fundamental policy change we need to make is we have to stop asking for that economy where we say it's okay, it's desirable, it's good. You know, Gordon Gecko, greed is good. No, it isn't. Yeah. Um, counterweight. I think that's a really important word. Yeah. Yes. Mike. Yeah. Mike, Mike. Yes. Mike Nelson. Um, I love this book, but I just got it yesterday, so I haven't had a chance to read it. <laughs> but clearly the vision you have of the future is similar to one we've been talking about for 25 years, which is tech enabling people to do new things with more information and more tools. But we're at a point now <clears throat> where the reputation of the tech industry has never been lower. It's kind of crashed in the last six months. Yeah. When I met you 25 years ago, we had unadulterated enthusiasm and optimism. Yeah. But partly because of the super money, which I understand, as he said, has, has eight pages in this book. No, no, more than that. It's a whole chapter. And a lack, a lack of trust, yeah. which has 14 pages. Yeah. And a lack of truth, which has eight pages. <laughs> we have this just th this incredible distrust of yeah. the tech industry. So, I, I, give me a scenario where we can turn that back, and we can actually get technology to make government be work better and business work better. And I'm going to make that question a little bit harder, <laughs> okay. um, just for fun, which is that we also have a lack of trust in government. Yeah. So there. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, I will say, uh, let me take the lack of trust in government. Uh, uh, we have had a concerted, you know, propaganda effort for decades to get people not to trust government. And uh, I, I think, you know, one of the things that uh, I, I know, I, 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 Jen is one of my muses, so I'm going to cite her again. She, when she started Code for America, she said, <laughs> I, want, I want to make government cool again. <laughs> and uh, uh, so I, I feel like, you know, uh, we can make government cool again, and uh, we need to. Um, but I think, you know, with tech, I think that, um, you know, we have to own up to the problems. You know, we have to own up to the fact that, you know, people, there's a lot of people in tech uh, getting very rich uh, for the wrong reasons and not tackling hard problems and not really doing the job. And there's a lot of people who, you know, we got to get rid of the, this chat about disruption and start talking about what we're going to build instead of what we're going to tear down. Uh, uh, and, that, and again, that is why I wrote the book. I wanted to influence the Silicon Valley narrative. And I don't mean the narrative as in how the PR narrative. I mean literally the narrative of what do entrepreneurs tell themselves. You know, one of the proudest things, the things I've ever been proud of stuff in my career is some entrepreneur who said, yeah, I had this startup idea. But then I thought, nah, it doesn't pass the Tim O'Reilly test, you know, because I, I tell people, work on stuff that matters. You know, you have, you have you know, technology is this great superpower. You know, it's kind of like, you know, we have movies about that. Spider-Man, you know, you're going to use your, your, your powers for good, you know, or you're just going to be a, you know, cool kid, you know. And it's like, we got a lot of cool kids out there who haven't figured out that they, you know, as the Spider-Man saying goes, with great power comes great responsibility. We often think that that's part of what equitable growth is trying to do with um, economists and other social scientists mm -hmm. to encourage them to ask really important questions mm -hmm. that are about um, that, that can help us inform policy. So we have that same ethos. Yeah. So it's it's actually very it's kind of a simple. Well, chills by, down by the way, spine. I was not bitten by a radioactive spider, but I was injected with radioactive copper when I was 14. Wow, <laughs> more on that one after this question over here. <laughs> Uh, so I'm a self-employed person, so I'm, I'm a huge enthusiast for the portability of benefits like you described, whether it's paid family leave or social security or health care through the Medicaid expansion and ACA yeah. uh, or retirement benefits, things like that. But one um, role that the workplace-based organization has had over the years is workers being able to negotiate for the terms of their own employment. Yeah. And 
when you talk about the portability of benefits, it sounds like you're talking about the portability of work in a way that would deprive workers of the ability to organize together, whether they're 1099 employees yeah. or W-2 employees in order to structure the terms of their employment and their wages and their yeah. income outside of the extraneous benefits that I agree should be very yeah. portable. You can't make portable driving for Uber. You'll always be driving for Uber and you need to have a say in the yeah. terms of your employment. Yeah, I, I think that the question of, of the market power of, um, uh, of labor uh, is one of those things that we need to fix. You know, again, I, I think we had a bunch of laws that were well-intentioned, and, and then we saw over a period of time, you know, I mean, you know, the early labor unions, oh my gosh, they were addressing these uh, incredibly bad working conditions and so on. And then uh, it became a, a mechanism for, you know, extractive rents, just like businesses, you, you know, extract rents. And everybody said, oh, we hate labor unions, right? As opposed to saying, wait, we got to fix them. You know, we got to fix this issue. We need you know, workers to have power. And I love that there's some new things happening in tech, you know, organizations like coworker.org, you know, which is, is getting, you know, uh, people with distributed jobs, you know, baristas or whatever, uh, to be able to have worker voice. They, you know, they haven't yet really affected, uh, you know, big, you know, wage conditions, but they have uh, had, had an impact on, on, you know, companies like Starbucks, uh, you know, uh, Workers Lab, uh, which is a really interesting, uh, you know, uh, effectively tech lab trying to figure out how do we use technology to give more power to workers and deal with issues like wage theft or, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, use technology to actually, uh, uh, in this networked world, uh, yeah. to give people new forms of organizing power. And I, I think there's a lot to be discovered here. Uh, you know, and I think the biggest thing that I, I think I, I'm asking for from everybody in tech and policy is don't take the world as a given. You know, what tech teaches us is, you know, periodically uh, we have, well, actually all the time, but, but especially at some times, we have this crystallization of all these new capabilities and we have to make the world new. One last question, yeah. So you mentioned that at the root of many of the problems you're identifying is the economics of scarcity. Yeah. And I wonder what you think are the most meaningful ways to both attack that narrative and then to your point about building something, build a story of post-scarcity for an alternative vision to that. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think the... Uh, you know, history is the best antidote uh, to short-term thinking. And, you know, I look, for example, at, you know, what's worked in the past. You know, we reduced working hours, you know. Uh, that was pretty powerful. You know, we went down from 70 hours to about, you know, 40. And, and you know, if you look at household labor, uh, you, know, uh, you know, the work women used to do in the home, that went down to about 15, you mm -hmm. know. I mean, you know, it used to be you, you had this bifurcated... Uh, you know, men work 70 hours and women work 70 hours and, you know, men, we, we brought down what were traditionally men's professions to 40 and we brought down what women's work used to be to 15 and then we said, well, oh, great, we can, we can prop up our low wages by bringing these women into the, the, the you know, the, the, the male jobs and, and uh, that'll decrease the power of labor and so we can, we can pay less, you know, <laughs> instead of going, wow, we could actually use this to bring down working hours even more, you know. And of course, that's what they've done in places like Norway, where they've taken their oil wealth and they said, well, let's just have everybody work a little less. Let's have generous social benefits. And, you know, I guess to me, you know, there's a lot of evidence from around the world that the way we do it here in America is not the only way to do it, and it's not the best way to do it. So they say. Um, I don't know. Um, so I have one last question, yeah. which is very self-serving. Um, uh, and I gave you a hint on this one before, so hopefully you've got, you've got at least a few suggestions for us. So equitable growth is a grant-giving institution. We're a research institution. Mm -hmm. We are constantly on the lookout for really important questions that we should be devoting our resources to, encouraging scholars to investigate. Yeah. And you know we've we've talked about a broad range of issues, many of the things in the book that we did not get to this evening, and um, 
you know, what kind of economic or other social science research do you think would help us push beyond what we don't know? And as you were putting this book together, were there are there questions yeah. or places where you really would encourage us to go? Well, uh, a couple of things that uh, come to mind. One is this whole idea of the economics of platforms and mm -hmm. understanding the dependencies between companies better and the allocation of value. You know, I, I think that there's... Um, uh, you know, there's some interesting, you know, self-serving attempts by tech companies to write economic impact reports. You know, so Google says, well, here's the value to our advertisers. And, yeah. you know, but just really rethinking the fundamental, you know, understanding of the flows of money in companies and in the economy. You know, there's, there's a, there's a, my, my son-in-law uh, does a lot of energy research and he uses a tool called the Sankey diagram, which is a, basically a way of showing uh, flows. And he's identified all of the energy flows, you know, how much energy goes into making things, uh, you know, into transportation. There's a massive Sankey diagram for the, the energy economy. And I go, we need Sankey diagrams for the money flows in ecosystems. And, you know, who gets what? And, and I love the title of Alvin Roth's book, Who Gets What and Why, which is yeah. a book about market design. Uh, you know, because first of all, it gets across this idea that markets are designed and they can be designed better. You know, Roth got his Nobel Prize for work on matching marketplaces uh, for kidneys, you know, kidney transplants. And, you know, the design of the market made a huge difference. You know, and we have to get rid of this idea that the market is just this natural phenomenon and start get to designing it better. And the fundamental research on who gets what and why is, to me, the fundamental economic question of the 21st century. Because... You know, it used to be was, well, how do we produce more was the yeah. fundamental question. And now it's like, no, there's plenty to go around. It's just not going around. Yeah. Well, that's, that is a place to end for this evening. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I, I want to just thank you for um, the hope and the optimism and the obvious just, um, uh, just joy that you find in talking about these issues and thinking about them. Mm -hmm. It's infectious and it certainly improved my mood and my evening. I hope it has done the same for all of you. Um, so thank you so much, Tim, for being here with oh, us. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me and uh, thank you so much for the work that you do because, uh, you know, understanding how to build that future world where we share the prosperity that, as Keen said, that uh, uh, compound interest and, what was it, compound interest and, um, and well, I'll just say ingenuity have brought us, you know. Uh, you know, yeah. that's the challenge. Yeah, I, I agree. So we'll get yeah. back to work tomorrow morning yeah. after right. our <laughs> drinks tonight. All right, all thank right. you all. Thank you.